Omar, who would be the moderator for tonight's session. Thank you, Anura. And welcome to everyone and to our guest, um, Dr. Sian Kwa. I'm going to um, start off this evening by a small introduction by Dr. Bola with regards to Dr. Kwa, who has um, given up his time rather than being in bed and sharing his fantastic views about refractive surgery. So, Dr. Bola. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another session. Um, what uh, we are very fortunate today to have Sian Kwa present to us on refractive surgery. And me and Sian go back a, a long way from the days of trying to get a basic job to do some uh, basic training in, in eyes since the days of Windsor and then the days of Liverpool. <laughs> and then, um, you know, so it's great that we have uh, transcended in both spheres, both uh, in Trinidad and, and Sian um, in the UK. And it's really, really a privilege to be able to introduce him today um, on this forum. So Mr. Uh, Dr. Kwa I graduated from the university, the Queen's University of Belfast in 1994. He was first appointed a position as a consultant, NHS consultant in 2006. Uh, he's trained at many prestigious universities in the UK. That includes Morfield Eye Hospital, Guy's and St. Thomas's in London, St. Paul's Eye Hospital in Liverpool. And that's where he really got all his registrar training years. And over the years, he's built up a very busy and successful uh, refractive practice in the Northwest of England. And some of the things that he specialized in and we very interested in is, is refractive surgery, advanced cataract surgery, complex cataract surgery, and vision correction surgery, including laser, lens replacement surgery, and ICL implantation surgery. So I don't want to continue. It's too much to go into his research and all of that, Sion. So I'll let you uh, take over. Thank you, Sion. Thank you. You can see me, yeah? Yeah, well, good evening, uh, everyone. Greetings from UK. And, uh, and thank you very much to Anura, Vinit, and, and Ronnie, and, and obviously Trina Eye Hospital for this invitation. So today's uh, talk is, is not long, and essentially I, I want to talk about you know, things that we should consider in terms of the preoperative you know, kind of uh, assessment of uh, a workup of patients considering refractive lens surgery. And I'll just begin my, I'll just get my screen, start broadcast, okay. Right, okay, so uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a consultant ophthalmic surgeon in the UK in the NHS and I have a private practice as well and I'm based mainly in Cheshire. And no, so the, I think to start off with, I think we all know, I'm sure the trend is very similar in Trinidad as well, right? You know, the, uh, the refractive lens surgery as well as cataract surgery is, is certainly becoming more, more kind of popular in the past 15 years. And more and more patients are now coming to see us, opting for better lens implantation to kind of optimize their visual outcome post-operatively. And there are more and more different type of lens options available. So starting off from our monofocals to premium monofocals, EDOF lenses, which stands for extended depth of focusing lenses, multifocals, and also Rayner in UK makes a supplementary secondary lens implant that can be used to correct re any refractive error, su such as you know, cylindrical error, and even introduce multifocality to the eye. And because of all these changes, I think assessment of suitability is now you know, more important than ever before. Now, Okay, so what should we do, right? And I've made this quite brief. Obviously, we're all 
you know, are very familiar with history taking. And but these are the things I certainly would want, you know, to see in the notes uh, presented to me, right? You know, if somebody's considering refractive lens surgery, I want to know whether they are glasses wearer or context lens wearer. If they, are, they wear contact lenses, what type of contact lenses? Is it single vision? Is it, mo you know, do they practice monovision? Do they wear multifocals? And when it comes to assessment, you know, assessment of patients uh, who wear contact lenses, it is most important to know when they want the last one contact lenses because it is believed that you know contact lens changes the 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 shape of the eye so in my practice patient comes to see me you know if they've worn soft lenses non-toric i would advise them to abstain from lenses for one week before assessment toric soft lenses two weeks and rigid gasper lenses four weeks it is important to know if patients got pre-existing amblyopia. In my personal practice, patients with visual QD of best corrective visual QD of six nine or lower should not really be offered multifocal lenses. And likewise, I want to know patient has had any history of visual correction, such as laser visual correction in the past. You want to know, as particularly patients are opting for multifocal lenses, if they have had ocular trauma, whether they have had some sort of significant head injury, because that may affect the position of the lens. You, and it is important to know, you know, if patients has had treatment for optic nerve problems, such as glaucoma, and on whether a patient has got any macular pathologies, such as macular degeneration, etc. Now, in terms of visual acuity, I think it is most important that we record what is the unaided and best corrective visual acuity for all distances. Refraction is important as well, right? And never forget that, you know, the, 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 the hypo in particular, if they are eight diopter of more, they will lose one line of their snell and visual acuity if you, you know, make them emetropic with lens which means that somebody, for instance, if they're six, nine, you know, a presentation with a pair of glasses with a plus nine prescription, these guys, if you make them emetropic, they would drop, they, there's a possibility they could drop their vision to below driving sight. Dominancy of eye is very important to know as well, because particularly if patients want to opt for monovision, and even patients, you know, opting for multifocal lenses or, and sorry, particularly the, the kind of a premium mode of focal lenses, the, you, you can manipulate, you know, the vision to give them better depth of range of visions by providing them micro mode vision. And that depends on how accurate or how well you know which eye is dominant prior to the operation. Now, in terms of assessment, right before you put patients slit them and dilate them, make sure you check the pupil size, right? Pupillometry is essentially is an infrared, you know, measurement of the pupil size. And in practice, you want to treat patients with topic pupil size of less than six millimeters. The reason why this dimension is important is because most intraocular lenses, the optical zone of it only goes up to six millimeters, which means anyone with you know, nighttime pupil size larger than six millimeters are likely to suffer from significant glare postoperatively. It is debatable in uh, how much, you know, how small a photopic pupil size could be. Zeiss has recommended that scotopic, sorry, a photopic pupil size of less than two millimeters should not be offered in multifocal lenses. But then again, we know small pupils give you better depth of focusing. So it is, you know, there's no kind of general consensus, but, but certainly certain companies do advise, you know, that, you know, patients should have a larger than two millimeter photopic pupil sizes before you would consider offering the multifocal lenses. Now on slip examination, Again, there's lots of things you can find on slip examination, but these are the more important things I like to see on, on, uh, on the clinical notes, right? You want to know what is a tear from like, right? And it is becoming more and more common in 
I think in my, you know, from what I can see with my patients that, you know, post-operative dry eye seems to be a lot of, a, you know, becoming a very common issue for my patients in that I treat. And so it is important to know what it was like preoperatively. Look at the staining pattern, right? You know, patients with, like, say, for instance, intrapopular staining is more likely to suggest, you know, to be suggestive of pre-existing dry eyes. And we all know uh, the contact lens staining pattern. And also, you know, patients with kind of inferior cornice and, and conjunctival staining will probably allude you to possibility of myoglobin gland diseases. So, so record the pattern of staining on the notes. And then we assess the epithelium. Oh, sorry. And then we assess the cornea. And, and you can, you know, generally, you know, break down the cornea examination to epithelium, but look for pattern dystrophy. That's quite common. And uh, look uh, for changes in the stroma and, for, and, and also endothelium. And obviously, any stroma changes will, you know, especially if it's within the visual axis, it will probably preclude patients from having you know, again, multifocal lenses and endothelial is obviously important. You need to exclude patients with Fuchs endothelial dystrophy because condition as such will reduce their contrast sensitivity. So, which means it may not be a good idea to offer the multifocal lenses in the first place. <clears throat> look at the lens before you carry out the surgery. Look for pseudoexfoliation, look for phacodinesis check the intraocular pressures, and then do a proper funder examination. I recommend everyone should have their retinal periphery examined because a lot of these patients, you know, will come, right? And many of them could be very short-sighted. They could have, you know, a lot of kind of changes thinning of the retinal periphery. So you have to document these very well because they are at risk of retinal detachment following surgery. Now, moving on, in terms of investigation, corneal topography is, again, extremely important in uh, assessment of these patients. The reason why is because we have to, to manage their astigmatism really well. And in practice, anyone, you know, that wants to gain, you know, most from, from their lenticular vision or, of uh, sorry, the implant vision, you, you really, really need to aim for astigmatism of less than half a diopter. And not just that, corneal topography will also show up certain conditions such as keratoconus, form first keratoconus, which again, you know, what could preclude them for future laser enhancement. And a lot of these machines now will be able to help you to identify dry eye diseases and obviously having corneal topography, you can co cross-reference with the K found on biometry. biometry. Generally speaking, comparing to the, the, uh, the measurements of biometry, corneal topography and biometry should really, you know, they're quite uh, kind of consistent in terms of their excess uh, measurements, but uh, Corneal topography tend to show lower stigmatism than biometer. And the other thing that's quite useful about corneal tomography is higher order aberration. I'll just show you some of these kind of scans of my patients, right? So this one is quite easy. This is a, a very nice normal topography with cornea stigmatism of approximately 0.5. So patients like that, it's easy to treat, right? And, and, and this patient in practice can have pretty much anything, kind of multifocal, EDOF lenses can have prima bona focal lenses. And then this one is a patient with a very regular astigmatism, okay, as shown by here, right? So you know, so you know this patient has got 375 doubt of cell, and from here you can tell is, is very, is orthogonal, is very regular, and then this is where the, 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 uh, pupils are, and then you can see, yeah, this patient will do very well with toric lenses. And then, no, this patient, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't scan the biometry. The biometry of this patient shows 1.8 diopter. And generally speaking, you know, I put in toric lenses for patients with astigmatism of one and a half or higher. 
And so if you were just to look at her biometry, it would show 1.8 doubt uh, of, of cell. And then, uh, but if you look at the corneal topography, right, you know, you realize that there's, it's actually really hard to work out. You know I mean? You know, there's no obvious access. And essentially this patient got very irregular cornea astigmatism, right? And, and, and clinically this patient actually has basement membrane dystrophy. So this patient will not be a good candidate for a toric lens implantation. And the management of this patient at the moment, uh, I only saw this patient recently, and this patient is going to have an eczema PTK to smoothen this cornea surface. And then, and, and then we will see what he ends up with. And if he ends up with quite, you know, kind of flat and regular cornea, then he could possibly have a, a premium monofocal lens. And again, you want to avoid multifocal lenses in patients like this. Now, this patient is actually a friend of mine, and uh, so he hasn't got too much of astigmatism, as you can see here, but what's interesting is that he's got this, you know, kind of elevation on uh, the posterior corner surface, so essentially he has got formphorous keratoconus, right, and so in practice, he does not need a toric lens, right, but the question is, is he suitable for multifocal lenses, right? And then, and because of what this has shown up, okay, so we went on and checked his high order aberration, right? And 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 if you got any co decent corneal you know, tomographer, and you can get all these kind of calculations on it. Essentially, you know, you look at the these kind of numbers, yeah, the root mean square of the high order aberration at six millimeter kind of pupil size, you want it to be less than 0 0.5, right? And and uh, and so his is 0 0.37. So in practice, he could have a multifocal lens. Now, uh, I wouldn't talk too much about OCT because I know very little about it, right? Essentially, it's very good at scanning the back of the eye and, uh, and in, yeah, I would say in practice, it is better than me in, you know, in picking up, you know, very subtle macular pathology. Okay, I, I say that I'm good enough to pick up AMD, possibly maculedema, and, but very subtle, subtle epiuretic membrane can easily be missed, but certainly, you know, things like VMT, they, these things can easily be missed just by looking, you know, on the slit lamp. And, and this is one of the patients and, 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 and it, essentially, this shows that it's got a very, very subtle you know, epiuretic membrane. And patients like that, you wouldn't really want to put multifocal lenses. And not just that, you have to tell patients that oh, whatever you do, there's always a risk of the epiuretic membrane progressing. They've got higher risk of cystoid maculedema as well. Now, so moving on, then we well, just want to quickly talk about biometry. Biometry essentially is the measurement of the eyes that brings you to your lens power decision. And generally, you know, this is a, a very kind of a, a very general guideline published by the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in 2018. Essentially it tells you that, you know, small eye, Heiger's formula is very good. Hoffer Q is very good. And then kind of average 24 to 26 eye, SLKT is recommended, Barrett's Universal 2 is good. And for the big eyes, Hygus and SLKT are good, right? So, so is this good enough? The, you know, is this guideline good enough? The answer is yes, right? You know, but things have moved on, right? Okay. And this is very typical of, uh, this is a patient of mine again, right? You know, this is what I get, and this is a printout by uh, Lensstar. Uh, I like, you know, uh, the kind of multi-formulae printout, right? You know, because say for instance, in this patient, right? You know, the, this is an eye, you know, whereby if I were to use different formula, right? You know, then it, they do suggest, you know, slightly different power, right? You know, this is why your knowledge of biometry is quite important. What the college has shown us is essentially the kind of third generation uh, biometry calculation, which is what that was published in 2018, but things have moved on, it's like everything, right? You know, generally speaking, the third generation biometry, right? 
uh, well, maybe you go back a little bit, okay? A, a power of a lens you decide to put in the eye is essentially based on the shape of the eye, which is the, the kind of uh, the, the K readings, right? The axial length, and those are what's called the effective lens position. So basically, mathematically, all this third formula, third generation formula, will have a, a, their own way of, of estimating where the lens, the, the intraocular lens lies within the eye, right? You know, and then and 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 then so the health is what's known as the lens constant, right? With SLKT is known as the <coughs> A constant. Right, you know, but Hoffman also has his own kind of uh, posterior chamber a uh, constant and so on like that. So essentially, that's what it is, right? You know, and in practice, they're all just based on three measurements, right? You know, then the fourth generation comes out. Okay, so fourth generation such as the Holiday Two, right? You know, Holiday Two will take into account patients' age, take to patients' uh, account and uh, patients' prescription. Right, you know, I think there's about seven parameters as compared to the, the third generation has got three parameters. So, so in practice, the more information you put in, the more accurate theoretically is your outcome, right? And likewise, HIGAS as well is a multi kind of a, uh, kind of a multi kind of, kind of constants that is associated with the characteristic of the lens and the patient that gives you this kind of a uh, lens uh, proposal for you to put into the eye. I think as we talk about the uh, corneal topography, the ray trace is another way of uh, working out what lens to, to use in the eye. Essentially, ray trace is a software within the, the the topographer or tomographer that works out the power of the front and the back of the eye. And, and then it works out the, the effective power of the cornea. And the advantage of this is that ray trace can also be used in post laser eye. The problem with laser eye surgery is that laser eye surgery changes the anterior curvature of the eye. And all biometry, you know, including the fourth generation, such as the Holiday and Hikers, <coughs> they assume a relationship of the anterior and the posterior of the cornea. And obviously we know if we laser the eye, you change the curvature of the front of us. So therefore the relationship between the anterior and posterior cornea curvature no longer hold true, right? Now, so therefore there must be another way of working how how, how effective or how powerful is the entire cornea is. And ray trace is very good at doing that. So it will work both for a virgin eye and also a post laser eye. And uh, whilst we're talking about kind of post uh, refractive uh, laser biometry, it is worthwhile knowing that, you know, there's, there's many, many online calculators now available. And the one that I use quite a lot of is the ASCRS calculator. And, and that will, you know, give you multi, you know, kind of multiple uh, biometry calculations for patients who said laser eye surgery, whether it's a hypoopic or myopic correction, and also radio keratotomy uh, treated eyes. And a more kind of a more than one is a Barrett's True K calculator, which you can also get it online for free. And, and this one is quite good because it also gives you a biometry calculation for keratoconus. And toric online calculators, another way of working out what kind of lens you need to put in patient's eye. And, and all these are completely free and available. But obviously the, the one made by Zeiss, Rayner, Alcon, and Johnson Johnson will be very specific for their lens only. Whereas with the Barrett's toric calculator, it, it is a universal calculator. As long as you know some of the information about the lens, you should be able to use that calculator to work out what your patient need. So we're coming towards the end, right? So, so all the things I've mentioned is uh, important, I think, right? You know, 
And in terms of endothelial cell counting, I think that is at your discretion. If you have that, you should use it, I think. I don't use it on everyone. I, I use it on patients who might feel that, you know, it's not, you know, normal, right? You know, and again, this has got obviously bearing on the kind of outcome of the patient, right? But in practice, if you can see chronic catarta, you shouldn't really offer a patient multifocal lenses. And if you got a quantitative measurement of the cells, right, you know, such as this, this one is good, right? So, so in practice, this patient, you would be able to see catarta. That's what these kind of big black spots are. <clears throat> but the cell count of this patient is 2,200, right? You know, so the cell count is very high. And, and you can confidently tell this patient that, well, if all goes well, your cornea should be okay. Because in practice, if we consider that, well, you know, if we lose, we, on average patient probably lose about 10, if you're unlucky, 20% of their cells, you know, from cataract operations or refractive lens surgery. And, and providing that number stays above 700, you should maintain clarity of the cornea. So in summary, and uh, I think, you know, today we're, we're, we're kind of seeing patients who more and more patients who are opting for premium lens implantation. And to be successful, you've got to select your patient well and your assessment and the use of all the new diagnostic equipment, I think are the keys to, to the success of your practice. Thank you. Cyan, thank yeah. you very much for that wonderful um, talk. Uh, thank uh, you. Thank you very much because uh, you've taken us through a masterclass, actually. Well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> so I think while I wait for Ronnie and Dorian to um, get ready with their questions, yeah. um, Ronnie, um, you have any questions? Um, well, first, I'll just like to you know, make a comment. I, I am so happy we have Sia. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you haven't got me, man. Just, I'm in England. I'm a long way away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at least we have you for, for consultation with the Trinidad Eye Hospital, with CBRS. Oh, I enjoy that. I think it's good. Yeah. I think it's good. You know, the collaboration is amazing. And it's really good that we have you helping us to develop our refractive here. And, you know, we're hoping that the future brings you here more regularly than the carnival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I really am confident that we would be able to offer a lot of the services that you offer there, you know, here sure. in, the future, in the future. And it, it is a very specialized area. And, and when, you know, when you speak about it, you make it look so easy, but it is so specialized because when we are developing, because we are now seeing these patients and exactly what you said, Sion, is that patients are coming and asking us, you know, I, I, I don't want to wear these glasses anymore. You know, you have a solution sure. for me. So I don't have, I, I, because I, I didn't expect when I got to 40, five that I, I would now be having to put on these things all the time you know sure some of them get hypermetropic combined with the press biopia and, and yeah, they want sure. to know well, uh, how are we going to solve this so i think we've been questioned we've been asked and it's good to know that we have things out there which, which could uh benefit these patients and we could then offer them more and more in in the sure. practice and One of the things that we've been able to do here with you and with your support is that all our patients who need refractive uh, surgery, we can work them up, run all the tests and, you know, call you and tell you, hey, this is the situation. Here, say, this is what we have. And every single patient we have that we want to do refractive work on, every single patient we ask you, even if we think we know, you, you know, because this is such a complex area, we don't want to miss anything and sure. then we, in hindsight, have to call you for enhancement surgery or something, you know, which sure. is the yeah. issue. So uh, without saying more, I know Vin will have questions. I know 
uh, Dorian will have. So I'll let them have a little time too. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Ronnie. Thank you for the comments. And as I said earlier on, um, Cyan makes retinal surgery seem very easy. Retinal surgery? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Listening to your talk, it seems refractive surgery is your domain. We don't want to actually get into that area. It's best left to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not difficult. Uh, yeah. Dorian, um, could I bring you into the discussion? And if you have any specific questions or comments for Cyan, please. So thank you very much, Fan, for this very informative. Hi, hi, yeah. hi and uh, good to see you again. And thanks for the, this very, in, very informative um, session. So the first thing is, uh, I just want to put my thoughts out there because as anybody who has been brought up on a standard multifocal diet has a particular mindset. And um, what the, the question to you is, shall we be encouraging patients to have multifocals and EDOF, ED, ED, EDOF lenses and so on in, in those who are eligible or should be sort of be neutral and have just presented to them? Because, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I think you should be, fair in what you tell them right you know you you have to be you know they have to be realistic basically yeah and 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 uh, whether you like it or not you you yeah you you may yeah you, you have to make that judgment partly yourself right and and you have to make the call. I think if, if, if you feel that patient's not realistic, you should not really offer multifocal lenses, right? You know, I, I don't push multifocal lenses. And uh, say for instance, uh, like I mentioned, you know, it's patients who come to see me, right? You know, if they wear monofocal contact lenses, yeah? Somebody who's 60 years old, one monofocal contact lenses, now becoming contact lens intolerance. Those patients, I would never, never give them multifocal lenses because they're so happy with their monovision, right? You right. Know, so, so there's a certain group of people, right? You know, and and uh, to me, no, I, I wouldn't push it, but I offer it to them and then and they have to be realistic. They have to be realistic, yeah? And, and I, I always make the comment is to them is that you, you've got to be aware, right, you know, Anything I do, right, you know, it is aim, right, to primarily reduce your dependency on glasses, right? So, so you, you should never really tell a patient, look, if I stick this in your eye, you never wear glasses again. I think it may be true in some people, right, you know, but I think it is more important to kind of, you know, the, the, you, 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 know, you should, should not really never oversell you know, multifocal lenses, in my opinion. Right. Right. So thanks. Thanks a lot for that. Because what happens is that um, because of because I've been skewed towards monofocals and whatever it sure. is, we, we basically say this is the gold standard for it. But yes. what I've been, what over the last couple of years I've been doing is because in mm. Tobago, I now have access to a window where I could see the car park. Mm -hmm. I tend to determine who I offer my multiple focal lenses to, to a car type of car they drive up in. <laughs> yes. So I'm not sure if that is a reasonable way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I got no view of the car park either. <laughs> you know? But, but no, I, I think, I mean, it is changing. And, and I think, well, okay. In my practice, I can tell you I no longer use EDOF lenses. Yeah. So, so all these kind of, uh, in fact, I can't even remember the names now. EDOF lenses is, 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 is getting less and less popular, right? The next generation multifocal lenses are out now, right? You know, it, it works on different kind of mathematics, right? You know, and, and, and theoretically, Multifocal lens, you know, new one will never let you see further or nearer, but they will have less and less side effects, right? Your glare, halo, and ghosting, and so on like that. But now, what's really thrown a kind of a screwball to us in UK, and, and I'm sure it may be happening, is that these premium monofocal lenses, right? The premium monofocal lenses is 
fantastic, all right? And, 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 uh, and some patients are getting sight as good as they would be with multiple lenses. So that's something to watch out for, I think, all right? You know, and, and there, there are, you know, Algon is doing one called the Viviti lenses. I don't know, Ron, if you have that in Trinidad yet? No, not routinely. We still have the IQ. Right. Which is, yeah. Which is the, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so they've released the, uh, they released the, the uh, Alcon Viviti lenses, right? You know, the only problem about that lens, right? You know, is that it costs twice of Zeiss at Lisa that I use, which is the multifocal. So they're selling the monofocal for a thousand pounds, right? Wow. You know? Yeah. But it is fantastic. That's a, the annoying thing is fantastic, right? And then, <laughs> and then Johnson & Johnson have their iHans lens, which is also quite good. They will give you good intermediate and good uh, distant vision, you know, if you just aim for emetropia. And, and Rain has got their EMV. So that's a kind of new kids on the block, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so, so these are the new generation lenses, right? And then I'm trialing a, a, a lens called Hanita Intensity Lenses. And these are Israeli lenses. It's, it's, it, it, you know, it, it's mainly used in Europe. And, and I, I, you know, I, actually I was the first person to use it in UK. And there's four of us doing it in UK. We've done probably about two or 300 now. So we're going to collect the data and it seems very good. Yeah, it seems very good. So that's the next generation. And, and, but the annoying thing, as I say, the, 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 the outcome for Viti is fantastic. Really, really good. All right, you know, so, so I, I think it's exciting though. It's an exciting thing for us, right, you know, and, and it'll be wonderful if you can get a premium lens with no side, premium monofocal lens with no side effects that see as good as multifocal. That's the true winner, winner, isn't it? If you think about it, you know, but, but let's see, let's see, time will tell. Time will tell, you know, I mean, it's quite new. The Alcon Viviti came out this year, this year, right? And, and the problem is they don't have big data because I think the, the, pri the, the price is a little bit too high. The price is a little bit too high at the moment, but we'll, we'll, let's see, let's see what happens. Dorian, hmm. any more questions? Thank you very much, Sian. Um, that was a lot. That was the second question I was going to ask you, Premier Montefocal. So thanks a lot. And Vinici, you could take the floor again. Thank you. Thank you, Dorian. Thank you. Some questions coming from the um, chat, um, Sian. Yeah, and sure. One of the questions by Niall is, why not EDOF lenses? Because EDOF lenses, in theory, will give you near and intermediate vision. EDOF lenses are not designed to give you, sorry, EDOF lenses, beg your pardon. EDOF lenses are designed, if you, if you put the lens in aiming for emetropia, it will give you distance and intermediate. So you see your computer screen, but you can't read with it, right? Premium monofocal will give you exactly the same, right? And the difference between EDOF lenses and the premium monofocal is EDOF lenses has got side effects like a multifocal lens. They give you glare, halo, and ghosting, whereas a premium monofocal does not give you any side effects. So therefore, there's no point. In other words, you know, if you say that, well, okay, I can put up the side effects. I can, I, I will, I will accept this risk of ghosting, glare, halo. Then you take multifocal lenses, which will give you a, a much, much better range of vision, including your near sight. So therefore, EDOF has lost basically. Excellent. Thank you, Sian. Uh, it's very interesting that cataract surgery has changed from what it used to be to discussing the various kinds of lens implants that we put in and the outcome oh, yeah. that we Vinita get has these changed. patients. Yeah. yeah, we've seen it all, isn't it, Vinita? I think we're yeah, the yeah. generation that saw it all because... Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure because I remember my first job, I was using, a, you know, the keratoscope, the Javal keratoscope. Yes. And... <laughs> And 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 uh, 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 a scan, and A-scan, then I tell right. my computer, you know, and then I tell my con consultant, you know, this is the biometry. You know, what I mean, yes, that'll be considered dangerous now. You know, what I mean, <laughs> you know, and this is in the space of, well, 
five years. <laughs> no, no, I, I keep telling the residents that uh, if you remember, Sian, we used to have a session within our own timetables to do biometries for patients for cancer. Correct, surgery. isn't it? Uh, Vinny, that's yeah. what we did, isn't that's it? That's what we did. And to see the where it's modern come up. So yes. in the questions that's and the presentation that you've done, what has been the mm -hmm. most challenging part for the patient and for the process? So, sorry, say that again. If you what is your most challenging part in your discussion for refractive surgery with the patient and the process you explain to us? <clears throat> oh, I think that the most difficult part is you 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 have to make this call where you have to judge the patient. Yeah, you know? much as you're not supposed to judge real, you have to judge your patient, right? You know whether the patient is realistic or not. That's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the most difficult part, right? You know, I mean, scan and things like that is easy. Once you understand that, what I've said to you, you know, I mean, keep that lecture and then people who want to look at it, do take the lecture and, and, and you know, if you follow the principle, it's very easy to identify on paper who's good or bad, right? You know, but the, the expectation from, patient is the difficult part right this is what i've learned you know over the years yeah it's the it's managing the expectation yeah o always think, undersell uh, always undersell i think when it comes to things like that yeah, I think you know under promise the, the patient thing. yeah that's the key thing isn't it sam um, mm. what we have learned is to managing the expectations of the patient and, right. and keeping it as low as possible and the Correct. third message that I pick up is never say that you're going to be spectacle independent. That's right. Dependency will reduce is what we have to. Yeah, it's them. to reduce dependence on glasses. Correct. You know, I mean, I guess you have to give them a fair information. Isn't it? You can't Correct. really say that why well, it doesn't work. It, yes. it works. Yeah. But but the aim is to reduce dependency on glasses, I think, you know. And, and the other thing is, is certainly right. Everything. Yeah. I think this is another thing that's a little bit different with if an 80 year old come and see you, they have got cataract, they can't really see, that's fine, you know, but when if, you know, uh, 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 I mean, the ones that I, I see, you know, like you know, a, a, a 55 year old, emitropic press biopic, right? You know, so, so just the one the way reading glasses, got 20, 20 distant vision, you make sure you write everything. You make sure you write everything, mm -hmm. right? And, and likewise, you know, your, your documentation must be superb. I mean, I had a, a guy that uh, he came, he was, uh, I think it was about minus 10 or 12, right, you know, and, and he came through a good optician friend that I, I actually treated the optician and, and he came and then, and he's got all sorts of, you know, kind of snail track, cobblestone, white without pressure, everything, right, anything, man, you know, this is like, Excellent, you know what I mean? I say, look, you know, you're gonna have detached retina, you know what I mean? No PVD, yeah? You're gonna have detached retina, I know, yeah. And guess what? He had detached retina. He had it, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know? It's, it's, it's yeah, documented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you say that, I, I saw a guy today, he was 60 years old. Right. All, he came in with two glasses. He came in with mm. a, a over the counter, he got it to the pharmacy, reading glasses, a one, right. And he put a little rubber band around the, the two so he could identify <laughs> the one. And it was, sometimes he uses one, sometimes he uses the rubber band the two, right? And he's telling me, you know, he, he doesn't uh, like, he doesn't like this press myopia. He doesn't want to have this reading glasses problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I could give him, you know, a lens in the eye and solve this problem. I, yeah. I said to him, yes, we can do that, you know, but there is risk with it. We can give you glare blah 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 you know there's mm -hmm. a cost to it and then yeah. he said you know I, I just really wanted to know a, a lot of people come to you and they they, they don't really uh, want you to put the lens in their eye that that much but they really just want to know what is their options and what is the risk and they want to have that conversation with you sure you sure. know and, and that too you have to recognize where these patients are at where they are at and then you have to advise them, you know, this is not a, an option you should take lightly. 
Exactly, yeah. exactly. Isn't Let me it? give you some places to go, have a read, come back in a few months, let's see what's happening, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, I think I think that's a yeah. very important thing is to provide information for them to read thoroughly and then to make a decision to going ahead with these kind of surgeries. So, I think um, so. as I said yeah. earlier on, Sam, um, the meeting is largely directed towards optometrists. Um, sure. Any last message towards refractive surgery to our colleagues in the community? Well, I, I think, you know, I mean, you know, it is good to know, you know, I mean, or well, hopefully, you know, you, you, you learn some, you know, well, hopefully you, you kind of pick up a few things and, and, uh, and have, have a bit more understanding of, of how we do things and, and, and how we, you know, how much our practice has changed, right? You know, and uh, so, so in practice, you know, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, from, from this lecture, hopefully you'll be able to give some advice to your patient, say, oh, there are these things around, you know, this is what they normally do and so on like that. But likewise, you know, the message is that, you know, I mean, I think that also applies to the optician as well. And, and perhaps, you know, perhaps there's always something within me that I, I maybe my, pay, you know, my optometrist don't like me because if, if I do this, very successfully, you know, uh, the, the, the patient might think, oh, well, I never have to see optician again, <laughs> right? You know, so so there's a little bit of me sometimes say, well, maybe it's good to leave them a little bit short-sighted or <laughs> but, but it's not true. It's not true. Yeah. But but the thing is, you know, well, I think what it is is like uh, hopefully our, you know, the our, our optometry co you know community have learned that look, you know, things have changed, things move on, there's lots of options and it may not suit everyone. It may not suit everyone, but you know, if you got somebody who's pressed barbie, you have some contact lens intolerance and things like that, you realize that there's you know very nice you know solution for them out there, right? You know, and 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 it's it's, it's just being informed. I think is very good. Thank you, sir. And um, as um, Ronnie said earlier on, we have you uh, on the panel of our consultants. Who can always guide us in managing? Oh, these it's patients. always my pleasure. That's the most, my that's pleasure. The most important thing. And what we want to communicate to all our optometrists is our journey at CBRS and Trinidad Eye Hospital has begun with refractive surgery. And we have good, able support available. And this is the platform that we want to share what we are learning as we're going. We talk to the experts. And what we want to ask you all to do is to understand the expectations of patients and, and, and send them to us and see what we can do the best for them. So, um, Sian, thank you very much for your time. Oh, and thank you, wonderful, guys. Wonderful, wonderful <laughs> Thanks, conversation guys, huh? and wonderful chat. Thank you. So, very I good. know you have to run away and you have to operate tomorrow morning. I'll let you go to bed. Uh, it's 12 time. Yeah, it's 12 <laughs> o'clock. <laughs> if you want to stay on, no problem. Um, you're welcome so that I can badger you with some more questions. And uh, <laughs> um, in the chat, people, please can ask us questions. We will trouble Cyan while he's asleep. So no worries about that. Yeah, um, because on any more questions, just forward to me. I'll, I'll no write problem. back, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, awesome. guys. Thank you very okay. much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Cyan. Take care. Thank you for your bye -bye time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, bye -bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Right. We're now going to shift gears. I'm going to bring in Renel. Um, we will try to finish on time. And I will minimize questions. Um, and Renel, you can share your screen and get ready. And if anybody has any questions, please uh, post it on the chat. And we will try and answer your questions as we go along. Okay. You ready, Renel? Yeah. Hi, okay. everyone. So, so Renel yeah. is going to be sharing some very interesting cases. And there's going to be three cases. Um, from um, the practice, um, our own practice. So I'll let her do the hard work. Hi, everybody. So as Dr. Kumar said, I'm just going to be presenting on a couple refractive surgery cases at CVRS. So I'm just gonna share my screen now. You all can see the screen, right? Yeah. Just making sure you all can see it, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. We, we see it, yeah. 
Right, so the first case is a surprising outcome. We had a 55 year old female who was referred from her optometrist for right eye posterior capsule opacification and a left eye macular lesion. She had a history of right cataract surgery and right macular hole repair in 2016, but otherwise no other significant medical history. Her presenting views uh, in the right eye unaided with 2050 minus three, uh, aided was 2050 and the same pinhole 2050. Uh, on the left eye unaided was 2400, aided 2080 and pinhole 2080. Her pressures were normal. On examining the anterior segment, we found that she had mild posterior capsule pacification on the right eye and the left eye had an NS2 plus cataract. So we went on to examine the posterior segment and these were her OCT scans. So if you recall, we know that she had a macular hole repair in 2016. So this is the right eye on the top showing a closed macular hole. And in the bottom picture, this is the left eye and there are a couple of findings. So the first one is a partial vitreous detachment. The red arrow indicates an epiretinal membrane and the green one is a lamellar macular hole with intraretinal cysts. So our diagnosis at this point was right eye pseudophakia, mild PCO and a closed macular hole. And the left eye was NS2 plus cataract, a PVD, epiretinal membrane and a lamellar macular hole. And the plan was to do right yard yeah, capsulotomy for the PCO and left cataract surgery followed by left vitrectomy, ILM peel and ERM peel. So before we went on to do the surgery, we had to do some pre-op of the patient. So this was her biometry and we did it using ultrasound biomicroscopy. And some of the things that we look for when doing biometry are the key values or the keratometry readings. So on the right side, you can see a K value of 45 diopters and the left eye is 44.75. And we just look to make sure that the difference between the two eyes is not more than one diopter. So we want them to be kind of similar. Then we look at the axial length. So on the right side, it was 22.38 and 22.46 in the left eye. And again, you look to make sure that they're sort of similar. So you don't want it to have a difference of more than one millimeter between the two eyes. So from this, it looked good. And we went on to make a lens selection of 22.5 diopters, which should give a refractive outcome of minus 0.34, or a, a blue myopic outcome. So like I said, the pre-op was done. Uh, the biometry showed no major concerns. And what we do is usually check to make sure we have the correct patient name and the correct date of birth. In addition to no significant difference between the, in the axial length and K values between eyes. So some of the surgical details, we initially uh, plan to use a single piece 22.5 diopter lens, but during surgery, there was a tear in the posterior capsule. So instead, we used a three-piece IOL that was placed into the sulcus. And to compensate, one diopter of the power had to be taken off. So instead, a 21.5 diopter lens was used with the same A constant. So going on to the post-op. The first post-op, this was a day after the surgery was done. The right eye, this was post yag was 2030 unaided and aided was 2025. And in the left eye, it was counting fingers unaided and aided. But we weren't too worried about the vision in the left eye as it was just the day after surgery. Everything was okay, the eye was healing well and the eye well was in place. The back of the eye looked good as well. On the second post-op, we again checked the visual acuities and in the right side it was 2030 unaided, 2025 aided, same as before. And in the, in the left eye was still counting fingers, unaided, and then aided. So again, because it was just the second post-op, we didn't worry too much. And everything with the surgery and the eye had looked 
really good. So the eyewall was in place and the macula was flat. The anterior chamber looked good. So now on the third post-op, we still saw no improvements in the left IV. It was still counting fingers. And again, everything in the, with the eye itself looked healthy. So at this point, we were sort of concerned because the patient is still is seeing counting fingers in the left eye and we weren't sure why. So at this point, we recommended a refraction and a report. So right away, when the refraction was done, uh, one thing stood out was a really high myopic prescription in the left eye. So on refraction, I got minus 950, minus 1.75 at axis of five, which brought the patient to 2025. But if you recall, we expected a, a low myopic outcome. So this was really surprising. And then we went on to check her current spectacle prescription, which was minus 50, minus 50 in the right. And then the left eye was minus five, minus 75. So at this point, we were wondering what we should do next. So we were surprised by the refractive outcome and we had to go back and investigate the reason for this. So now we're thinking what we should do. So I'm just gonna ask uh, someone on the panel, uh, Dr. Bola, you care to give us your thoughts? Yeah, you know, th this is so interesting. I was just talking to Vinit here and, and telling him, most of the times people come to a meeting and they present well, their good uh, cases, you know, the good outcomes. I am so pleased to see us today switch <laughs> and feel really confident and, and, and um, you, Renel, for taking on the mantle of bringing something that didn't really work and to the forum and then asking the question, what, 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 what are we going to do? One of the key things here, I, I think, is um, to consider the patient and how they, they're probably feeling at this point, where they were expecting to be seen really wonderfully well, because you know, most of the times it, it, it works out really well. And now they're not seen at all, you know, in an eye that they were expected to read the chart, they seen calm fingers. I mean, that's that's pretty bad. So I know you're going to talk about how we're going to solve this problem, you know, what are the options? I know you're going to talk about how how we're going to investigate it and all of that. But one of the things I, I want to touch on is what we have to do at this point is consider the patient consider what that patient's fears might be at that point and make sure that that patient doesn't leave the clinic without us relieving all those fears of the patient. This patient will be thinking, I, I, am I going to go blind? I think that's the first thing. You know, is this problem something that you all have seen before? Can you all handle this thing? Can you all sort it out? And what really went wrong? Why would this happen to me? You know, so I think it's important to recognize these fears as a clinician and then have uh, spend time with that patient to make sure you address all of these concerns. And, and that, you know, this is my case. I, I really had, uh, I was, you know, almost sweating when, the, uh, when I saw the uh, problem, right? Because I knew something was wrong. Obviously this lens, there was a problem that we put in the eye. And what I did was I told her, I said, you know, I, I know this is something that you're really, really worried about, but I am telling you, you know, we could, we are going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to do everything to figure out what happened. We also going to make sure that we sort out this problem for you. What I need from you is to just give me time. You know, just give me time. I will be able to sort this out. Just give me time. I have to do all my checks, all my tests, or everything, figure out what it is, and, and then sort it out. But do not worry here. I'm going to sort this out for you. So, uh, Renel, I, I think that, that's what I wanted to say. Thanks, Dr. Bola. So, at this point, the diagnosis for the patient was a left post operative refractive surprise. 
And our plan was to do a critical incident report analysis where we would identify the problem by ruling, on, ruling out any surgical or pathological cause, uh, ruling out any corneal abnormality, rechecking the original biometry, and then repeating the biometry. And then after that, once we figured out what was the problem, we could determine a solution. So the first step was ruling out any surgical or pathological cause. So as you would recall, the patient also had a vitrectomy and a triple peel done in the left eye. So this just shows the pre-op and post-op scans of the left eye. The pre-op scan is in the bottom where you could see everything going on there. And then the post-op scan, which is on top, you could actually see the retina healing nicely, just a intraretinal cyst remaining, but it was healing quite nicely. And then this scan shows us that it was consistently healing. So uh, the scan to the right, you could see it almost fully healed. So we didn't really think the retina or the vitrectomy would have had anything to do with the patient's post-op outcome. We also did a thorough assessment of the uh, eye post-surgery. So we found that the surgery was done really well. There were no post-op complications, nothing like no corneal sutures, no IOL dislocation or subluxation. The IOL was placed in the sulcus, but it remained fixed and it wouldn't give such a large myopic shift in any, in any event. And the retina was also healing nicely post vitrectomy, ERM and ILM people. And there was no uh, macula edema or anything like that. So we went on to do a corneal topography. And what the corneal topography showed was that there was no abnormality in the cornea. So we couldn't attribute the post-op refractive error to this as well. So we went back to review the biometry. This is the biometry that I showed you earlier. So like we said, we didn't really pick up anything that was suspicious in the biometry because the values seem to be accurate. And you would see highlighted in blue, we got a axial length of 22.4 millimeters from which we chose a lens of 22.5 diopters. And we were pretty sure that, you know, this biometry was good. So then we went on to review the biometry, to, sorry, repeat the biometry. So we used a different biometer this time, a Zyma optical biometer. And in this instance, we got an axial length of 25.95 millimeters in the left eye. And you would notice the suggested eye well powers is almost about 10 diopters difference between the last biometry and this biometry. So we see a pretty large difference in axial length. The original axial length measurement given was 22.46 millimeters. And the repeat axial length measurements gave us axial length of 25.95 millimeters, which was a difference of 3.49 millimeters. And on average for every 0.33 millimeters measurement error in axial length, there's approximately one diopter post-op refractive error. So underestimation of the axial length by 3.49 meters would produce a refractive error of approximately minus 10.50 diopters. In this case, uh, the refractive outcome was minus 950 minus 1.75, which is approximately minus 1050 uh, spherical equivalent. So what went wrong? Unfortunately, the wrong IOL power was placed as a result of the wrong biometry values. To be honest, we're not sure exactly what went wrong, but we believe that the patient's name could have been entered into the system, but measurements taken for a different patient who was thought to be the patient. And then the data was printed and given to the doctor to view. So just a little bit about the biometry process. So first, the patient data is entered. Before the patient enters the room, you put their data, their name, date of birth, whether the patient is phakic or pseudo -phakic. The patient is then brought into the room, uh, seated, and measurements are taken. So the biometer takes axial length and key value measurements. From that, a range of eye well powers are 
and expected refractive outcomes are calculated automatically by the machine using a special formula. And then a report is formulated from all of those steps. The report is then printed and taken to the doctor who would review it and look for any inaccuracies or abnormal findings, such as a large difference in axial length or uh, K values. Once the doctor looks at it and the report looks okay, they would proceed to select an eye well power that would give the desired refractive outcome. And then finally, once the eye well power is selected, uh, the biometry record is then uploaded to the patient's electronic file which, from which the data is pulled for surgery. So we believe that the error could somewhere between steps one and two. So it was really tricky because we had the wrong biometry values, but the patient name was correct, the date of birth was correct. So how could we have known? So we just made a list of the information we had at the time and the information we didn't have. So we had the correct patient name, the correct date of birth, and an accurate looking biometry record. What we didn't have was the eye well power that the patient had in the eye from the previous surgery. We didn't have lensometry which is something that we would normally check, but if the patient has glasses at the time, and we didn't have a detailed refractive history for the patient. So now that we know, knew what the problem was, we knew it was the wrong IOL power, we had to come up with a plan to fix the problem. So what are some of the treatment options? I could probably pass this one to one of the doctors. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, because this is my patient, I, I might um, uh, answer. So I, I think, uh, Renal, I, I think you have the option of still finding uh, uh, a solution such as uh, a contact lens. So that would be an option that you could try, which is non-surgical. Right. And I did offer it to her. I did ask her, you know, would you, would you be okay with you just doing uh, something other than, you know, sorting the lens issue out. And she said, no, 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 she's not interested in contact lens. She would like to uh, have a, a surgical uh, option. So I said to her, well, we have two options with the surgical on the surgical side, which is, as Sian was talking about, and I've spoken to Sian many times on it, to use a piggyback lens on top of the existing lens. Um, in, in the sulcus. So these are called sulcoflex lenses and they basically correct the, uh, the error that, that we have. And uh, these are by Rena and uh, are readily available. All we do is make, do the calculations and get the lens and put it in the eye. The other option is to exchange the lens. And um, those would be the kind of options that I would have been thinking about at the time and had the discussion. Okay, thanks. Right, so just like Dr. Boa said, there were a couple options uh, we considered. So one was a IOL exchange. The second one was a piggyback sulcus IOL. And the third one was contact lenses, which she didn't want. So a management plan. We discussed with the patient what had happened and explained why she wasn't seeing well with the left eye. We then discussed with her the options and our plan to fix the problem. The patient was given some time to think about it. And once uh, she was ready, we proceeded with a left IOL exchange using a plus 12.5 diopter lens. So our outcome, the post-op outcome. So after the first post-op, we checked VAs on either and the right eye was 20 30, just as before, the left eye was 20 40. Um, which was right off the bat, the patient was happy with this because she was seeing much better. Uh, we did an AR on the first visit. Uh, it was minus 025, minus 125 at axis 17. And on the second post-op visit, uh, we did a refraction, which gave the patient minus 0 0.75, minus 1.25 at axis 14, which gave her 20-20 vision. 
And she was really, really happy with this outcome, you know, considering what had happened. So she was really happy with this. So now that we solved the patient's problem, we had to think about ways that we could reduce the risk of using the wrong patient biometry again. Post-op refractive surprises are really rare, but if but they're not impossible. Uh, they do happen from time to time. And when they do, it provides a good opportunity for improvement. From this case, it was important that we thought about ways to reduce the risk of this happening again. And as a result, we've decided to update our checklist for reviewing biometry to include the eye well power use if the patient had previously had cataract surgery. And, more, and a more detailed refraction history, as well as lensometry if they had uh, glasses. Yeah, so that was the end of the first case. Thank you, Rinell. Uh, no and uh, thank you to um, Ronnie for sharing this case. I appreciate the comments. It's uh, not an easy one to uh, present um, a complication. But the reality is that within CVRS, we do about 1,000 to 1,500 cases per year. And no matter how robust your process is, sometimes things do crop up. But I appreciate this slide, um, which uh, Renel has finished her talk with, to say that the clinical governance system that exists in the various checkpoints for cataract surgery has been updated, but we are reassured that these things don't happen often. And that for me is a good robust process which we can communicate to our patients and to our care providers as well. So we are happy to take any questions anybody has or any comments. Um, on this matter. I just want to ask Dorian if he wants to add anything. So thank you very much, Renel, for a well-presented case. It certainly is a very um, disconcerting thing when presented with such a scenario, primarily because everything on the surface looks kosher and you're now presented with something that doesn't make any sense. And uh, this process of... Um, retracing auditing our steps and looking at the um looking at the processes to see where we have had the error is as important one it's sometimes a lot we need to sort of sort of unblink ourselves and be open to all sorts of the suggestions and anything that could happen so i'm very pleased that we've come up with a modification on our procedure and our checks and balances to ensure quality control and assurance and um, it is one of those things we will probably never be able to figure out, but we pretty much know what has happened. Neutralization of the glasses is quite an important thing. IOL powers before, if we could find them for previously done eyes, which would help us quite a lot. But in this case, having looked through your presentation, I didn't see any way we could have probably picked this up other than the way it played out. But hopefully in the future, when we have more of our information collected, we should minimize this risk. So well done, Ronelle. And fantastic, Ronnie, and a good outcome. Yeah, thank you, Dorian. Thank you, Dorian. And one important thing um, Ronnie pointed out was understanding the patient's fears and anxieties to put them at ease with regards to that. But there's one more point which we don't talk about, is that the doctor, the surgeon is a human being as well. He does get upset. The team does get upset. When such a situation occurs, it's important that we all sit down, share our experience, and work together to improve the processes. Because all these things will not get better if the team does not get better. And for us, within CVRS and TEH, it's very, very important that we re-emphasize to ourselves about teamwork. Renel, thank you for presenting this case. Uh, Deborah, you wanna say something? Yes, hi, good night. Um, gosh, 
Dr. Dr. Kumar, you actually took the words straight out of my mouth. That, that was actually what I wanted to see, um, is that it, 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 is, it is a team effort. And sometimes often um, in the heat of the moment, yes, somebody may get chewed out. But what, what, what I appreciated with the way this was presented and handled was that it was a team approach and no one was made to bear the brunt of um, the error. And that it was uh, from, as, as Dr. Dwarika said, um, the team would get better moving forward. Um, we, we, you sit down, you run the audit, or, or you, you look back at what has happened. And then you, you look at the, the steps and see, you know, where things may go wrong and you improve from there. But that, that for me was the biggest take home apart from communicating well with the patient is that we are a team um, and, and, and that, you know, yes, errors can occur, but we, we are trying to make us ourselves better as a team. And, and it's not just, you know, the brunt of everything put on one individual. And, and that, that, was, that was, you know, a, a really important take home. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. And I know Priyanka is there on the um, meeting as well. So to her and her team, you are doing a fabulous job. Keep going and keep continuing doing the fabulous job you are doing. Um, I'll let Ronel continue. Okay, thank you. So the next on. two cases, I think Ronel is going to give you all an introduction about us um, dealing with um, what we call a toric lens implant and also clear lens extraction. So case two, historic IOL implants. We had a 53 year old male who presented to us because he was diagnosed with cataracts in both of his eyes. He wanted, he has been using glasses, sorry, since his teenage years and wanted to be less dependent on them. He had no significant past ocular history or no family ocular history. The only uh, positive thing was for high blood pressure. His presenting views, uh, and the left, uh, right eye, sorry, it was counting fingers and aided in both eyes, aided 2018 in the right and 2016 in the left, and on pinhole it was 2018 and 2060. And the pressures in both of the eyes were normal. So on anterior segment findings, we noticed NS3 plus cataract in both eyes, uh, but otherwise everything was normal. And on posterior segment assessments, everything looked pretty normal, except that the patient had some drusen and early signs of AMD in the left eye. So clinical findings. When we retracted the patient, he was minus seven, minus 050 in the right eye. And in the left, he was minus five with a minus three still. And that corrected him to 2060 in the right and 2050 in the left. So our diagnosis and plan, uh, we diagnosed the patient with bilateral cataracts and high myopia. He wanted to be glasses free for distance with no compromise, but he was okay to wear near corrective spectacles. The patient had early signs of AMD in the left eye, which meant we were hesitant to offer a multifocal option. We discussed early with the patient the premium lens options, a monofocal toric versus a multifocal toric. And the patient was really interested in having a premium eye well, monofocal toric placed. So then we decided we would do surgery on the right first, then the left with premium eye wells. Um, uh, any of the doctors just want to give an idea as to why like we thought multifocal wouldn't be a good option in this case? I yeah. want me to answer that question. I think, interestingly, your presentation follows what Dr. Kuo had been talking to us. Anybody with macular pathology, um, it has been shown that multifocal uh, needs to be avoided where possible any kind of retinal pathology. And I see um, that on discussion, Dr. Bola has done that and preferred to offer the monofocal um, toric lens implant for this patient. Yeah, yeah. I'll just add to that. Yeah. Um, 
So if you looked at his refraction, just go back to the one slide, I think. So what he was really was he was myopic since he was young, right? So he really wanted to, for the first time in his life to be relatively glasses free. And, you know, when I saw him, I thought, hey, I could make this, this happen for this guy because if I implant a lens in his eye, I could really, in his right eye, he doesn't have much um, uh, astigmatism. And if I could get him to be a low myo or emetropic in that eye, or close to emetropia, I, I know he's going to get, you know, somewhere 20, 30, 20, 40 vision at, at worst. So I knew I could, I could get him better with, with a, a, a monofocal lens in the left, in the right eye. I also knew in his left eye, I could, I could uh, almost guarantee him that I could reduce his astigmatism. I may not be able to get rid of his astigmatism, but I could reduce it. So I thought with this guy, I, I, I am not going out on a limb to promise him that, you know, with a monofocal uh, lens. Now, the option of a multifocal is versus a monofocal is there. But as Sian uh, pointed out in his talk very uh, eloquently, if you could get away with doing the monofocal um, correction and getting them um, 20 happy, you, know, you want to get them happy. You, you don't have to get them perfect. You just have to get them happy. So what I did was I promised him this is what I could do. However, you'll still need glasses for, for reading, uh, possibly, you know, uh, very likely. So I can't get your glasses free, you know? And, and he was really happy with that conversation. And, you know, what Sian was saying, this is the difficult part, trying to figure out with the patient what would make them 20 and be real 20 happy, not, not so much 20, 20 vision. And, and I thought he was a good candidate for a, a, a refractive premium IOL corrective surgery. And, and that's why we went this way. Okay, so I'm just gonna go on. Right, so a little bit about the pre-op details. So because the patient was astigmatic on refraction and well, for all patients before they have refractive surgery done, we do a corneal topography. So this confirmed that the patient had astigmatism in the left eye, it's kind of small, but if you could see on the left eye, it said it has about 2.61 diopters here. But other than that, the corneal topography itself looks okay. So the patient didn't have any corneal uh, abnormalities. We did a biometry and again, looking at all the things we discussed before, uh, axial length, uh, key values, we decided uh, that the biometry was okay. Um, but because the patient was uh, astigmatic, we went on to use a toric IOL calculator. So these are, this is one of the calculators Dr. Kwa was talking about before. And um, so we use the Alcon online toric IOL calculator, which uh, confirmed that we didn't need a toric lens in the right eye and the patient was minus 450, still in that eye, I think. And on the left eye, it told us that we needed an 18 diopter lens placed at 81 degrees to give us uh, our expected refractive outcome. So going on to the surgical details, we did the right eye first. That was the eye that the vision was a bit more reduced in. And we used the 18 diopter Alcon IQ premium non-toric IOL. And the IOL was placed in the capsular bag and there were no, no surgical complications. On post-op, the eye was healing well, uh, the eye well was well centered and everything was okay with the back of the eyes. And on the first uh, visit, the patient was actually 20-20 in the right eye. And this is someone who was previously minus seven in the right eye. On the left eye, he was still counting fingers unaided. On refraction, we found a refract refractive error in the right eye of Plano minus 025 at 27. And while the left eye was the same refractive error he had from before, because we hadn't operated yet. So he was really, really happy with this outcome and he actually wanted to have the left surgery done as soon as possible. 
So for the left eye now, this was the, the eye that we used the toric lens in. And before uh, doing the surgery, uh, the surgeon has to mark the axis for the IOL. So first, the patient would have been seated upright on a chair and a toric marker would use to mark 90 degrees and 180 degrees. Then after that, you would use anesthetic and place it in the eye. And following that during surgery, the toric marker again would be used to mark the exact axis of 81 degrees. And the eye well was then implanted with the axis on the lens aligned with the calculated marked axis. And in this, as the toric calculator had shown, we used the 18 diopter lens. It's an Alcon IQ Premium Toric IOL. And it was placed at 81 degrees. And there were no surgical complications in this case. So in the first post-op, uh, the patient was counting fingers in the uh, left eye, but it was till the day after surgery, so we weren't too worried. On the second post-op, though, uh, when we checked VAs, he was 20-30 in the left eye. He was still 20-20 in the right, but binocularly, he was 20-20, and he was really happy with this. On post-op refraction, we still uh, found a residual cell, a small cell of, well, minus 1.25, and that brought him down to 2020. So I'll just ask one of the doctors if they want to make any comment on this. Yeah, so, so um, unfortunately, this, these are my cases, so it's kind of easy for me to say something. I, I, I think, you know, what we promised we delivered here, we, we told this guy, you know, unaided, he would be pretty much uh, functional without glasses and we were able to deliver on that. I, I know there is a residual uh, astigmatism, but it's still only three weeks post-op. So I would expect when we really refract him, you know, at, when he's fully healed, which is six to eight weeks following that, it will be uh, much less because he's already 2030. Remember you went from count fingers for his day post-op, now he's 2030. This cornea is still healed. So I, I, would, I would be really pleased that we have a guy 20 happy unaided, and that is what we were aiming for. We weren't aiming to give this guy zero um, on his uh, astigmatic correction. And really, remember, we place enough a lens in a fluid-filled bag on axis, and then we, 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 we expect that that lens will remain in that perfect position when we take the speculum off and we, we come out, it never really sits perfectly at 81. It, it will, there will be some movement. So we could never promise full correction of the astigmatism. And that's the key there. You have to tell them we could reduce the astigmatism. We could definitely get you seen a lot better than your minus five or, or, or how much you had there. But we cannot guarantee zero. Now, put, to put it in perspective, a minus 1.25 is approximately spherical equivalent of minus 0 0.5. And minus 0 0.5 is very little refractive error overall. And that is why he's 20 50. He's, he's seen really well. So I was really pleased, and he was also 20 happy. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ronnie. Um, the, the interesting thing with, as you rightly pointed out, is um, there's always a learning curve with historic lens implants. And as you rightly said, first, discussing the expectations with the patient and the outcome. And as Niall has pointed out in the chat, that the outcomes for these patients when all the processes are right is simply amazing. Um, and having done a few of these toric lens implantations in the UK, and these patients being spectacle, minimal spectacle dependence is fantastic, particularly myopic patients. Um, um, they really enjoy the journey. Um, Dorian, any comments? Ex excellent case presentation and excellent results, Ronnie. We're quite pleased about that. I, this, is a, this is always going to be a gray area and refractive surgery is not the easiest of things. It takes a little while, a, steep, a bit of a learning curve and... Uh, the, it, it gets better with the numbers. Also, also it's, um, it's also considered to be high-risk surgery. That is why we, it is a high insurance premium on it. 
the it basically tells you it's not easy to get off the bat and it needs a lot of patient interaction. We need to manage patient expectation. We need to manage the patients if they're applicable for the type of surgery we're going to offer them. And uh, then with the outcomes, they need to be on board with the treatment. So it has to be something, a shared care at a high level. And once we could get that in, in play, then we have the best chance of getting the outcomes. Remember, we have not reached the stage where we're, as in standard um, lenses, we're perfect. We're now developing this. We're now trying to feel our way through it. And we have lots of interesting little systems that have come on board. We have all automated systems. We have these systems that work on with the microscopes event that allow us to choose axes a little more. But in all of these, there are certain surgical errors that will happen because of the impossibility of, again, placing a lens directly on axis and expecting it to stay. So the patient has to be aware of the limitations we have at this point in time and be on board with it. And then we also have to be proactive with the with the results so that we could engage at the appropriate time to give the appropriate results. So very good work, folks. I think I would take a buzzword from what Dorian um, said is shared care. And that is the key thing with the whole team. I know we will be running over our scheduled time at the moment, uh, but because Renel has prepared for the third case, I'll try and be brief with this third case. Let's go Renel. let's go with the third case because that's also important to bring to the forum. I still have two more slides on this one. Oh, okay, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. So a little bit about toric eye well implants. They are astigmatic correcting lenses used at the time of cataract surgery to decrease post-op astigmatism. Uh, standard toric lenses are usually available in slow powers of like minus one to minus six diopters. In these cases, it is important to manage expectations as well as to perform a complete ophthalmic examination before offering toric lenses as cases of irregular astigmatism caused by corneal scars or ectasia are not suitable candidates. Other, other in contraindications vary where desired results may not be achieved include zonular instability, posterior capsule dehiscence, uh, poor pupillary dilation, and prior surgeries such as vitreoretinal procedures or glaucoma implants. A good candidate would usually be interested in spectacle independence, even if only for one focal point. Right, and what we were talking about achieving the desired outcome with these toric IOLs, one of the main things to consider is rotation of the lens. And the importance of a toric eye well being placed and remaining at the appropriate axis is critical for optimal performance. So a really popular study by Ma and Seng in 2008 describes that just one degree of misalignment can result in 3.5% of residual cylinder, whereas three degrees results in 10.5% and 30 degrees results in total loss of the toric astigmatic correcting effect. And various studies have also shown that it is not uncommon to see approximately between five to 10 degrees of rotation with these toric IOLs. The model of the toric IOL use can also influence the rotation of the lens. And as a result, because of all these things, it is important that patients are made aware of the possibility of a second procedure sometimes. And if the toric toric lens has rotated, it is most commonly resolved by rotating the lens back to the original axis in a follow-up procedure. Okay, so case three now. We have a 53-year-old male with complaints of gradually decreasing vision over the past five to six years. He started wearing glasses about eight years before and but does not like wearing them and wanted to be mostly glasses free for work in his mechanic shop. He didn't really mind having to wear the glasses for like finer print. Um, he had no other ocular or medical history of significance. So his presenting VAs were 2015 in the right and the left, then aided was 2020 in both eyes and pinhole 2020 in both eyes, with pressures of 11 and 12. The anterior segment was all good, the lens is clear. And the posterior segment findings was all good as well. On refraction, he had a refractive error of plus 1.75 in both eyes and an add of plus two, which brought him to 2020 in each eye at distance and near. 
he had a small change from his previous prescription, which was plus 150. So our diagnosis was hypometropia and presbyopia. So how do we manage the patient? Should we give them new glasses? Should we leave him with his current glasses? Or should we discuss the option of surgery? So um, you could actually do any of these because the patient was seeing well with his glasses and well, given him new glasses, he wouldn't, that wouldn't really change anything. But we decided to discuss the option of surgery because that was something that the patient was really, really keen on. He actually came in asking about uh, the option of surgery to reduce the hypometropia. So the patient, as we said before, he was keen on having surgery to reduce the hypometropia. His work as a mechanic involved mainly like knee and intermediate vision. So he would have preferred not to have to wear glasses for his tasks. Um, as a result, we discussed the option of surgery with monofocal versus multifocal eye wells and the pros and cons. So we discussed both and the patient liked both options, but he couldn't have the multifocal option because of financial reasons as those lenses tend to be more expensive. But he was still really excited about the monofocal lens as well. But he understood that there might be some compromise. We booked the patient for a right clear lens extraction and IOL implant to be followed by a left with a monofocal amen for a low refractive outcome. So this was his biometry. Everything looked good. And we chose a lens of 20.5 diopters to implant. A uh, 20.5 diopter monofocal IOL was a standard lens was used and there were no surgical complications. His post-op VA, the eye was healing well. Uh, everything was okay. His unaided distance VA was counting fingers in the right and 2060 in the left, but again, it was just right after surgery. On the second post-op visit, um, he had an unaided distance VA of 2020 and in the left 2050, the same as before. Um, his unaided near VA was 2030. And um, he was really happy with this because even though he probably would st have still needed to wear glasses for like really, really fine print, he was able to manage to do most of his near and intermediate tasks because it didn't really require that fine detail. So the plan for this patient is to do left clear lens extraction and aim for low myopic outcome as he was plano in the right eye. So the patient is just taking some time and then he would opt to do it later on. And well, clear lens extraction, as the name suggests, is simply the removal of the natural clear lens of the eye and replacing it with an artificial IOL. And increasingly, people aged over 40 are electing to have clear lens extraction to correct a number of vision problems. It can be especially valuable for those patients who have had to wear glasses or contacts all their lives and those who may not be candidates for LASIK. So some of the checklists for artificial eye well implants, some of the points that the surgeons consider are what the patient needs their vision to do, what the patient's expectations of surgery are, whether the patient would be tolerant of some reduction in contrast sensitivity, how the patient would handle glare after surgery, and ensuring we don't make a hypometrope too myopic because they wouldn't like that. And when it is we explain lens options to patients, it's important that we set expectations. So just like Dr. Kwa was saying, we try not to overpromise the patient, we try to give them realistic expectations. And this is actually uh, like a flowchart of what we actually present to the patient when they're going to have surgery done and the option of lenses. So we tell them with a monofocal lens, there's 40% chance you still need glasses for distance vision after, and there's 40% chance you need glasses to read newspaper print. If you do a toric lens, there's 10% chance you need glasses for distance, but 40% chance you need glasses to read newspaper print. And a multifocal lens, you'll have 10% chance you need glasses for distance and 10% chance you need glasses to read newspaper print. 
the patient is fully aware and they don't have too high expectations of the surgery. Sorry, and this is just a summary. So refractive surgery, specifically artificial IOL implantation is a viable option for patients, even those who may not have had cataracts. There are several options, um, including monofocal, toric, and multifocal lenses. Each patient case is really different, so it's, it's important to individualize patient care, listen to what the patient hopes to achieve, and set realistic expectations. The most important thing is that the patient achieves 20 happy vision. Yeah, and that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, you've done most of the hard work today. Not most of the hard work, all the hard work. <laughs> all the hard work. Uh, so fantastic. And thank you once again for doing a brilliant job in putting everything together. And clear lens extraction is not an easy decision to make. Um, and uh, we know the challenges that come with it. I'll come up with um, Dorian. Do you have any comments? Excellent work, team. So we're, we're quite happy with the, the fantastic work you guys have done. Renelle's excellent stuff. And it's a quite an important topic because now that we have reached a stage where cataract surgery is as re reproducible as it is, and that we now have standard cataract surgeries with success rates greater in excess of 99%. We've, with low complication rates and the chance of serious risks less than one in a thousand, we've now have been able to now direct our attention towards offering not just a cataract for the purpose because of the morbidity of having cataracts, but for offering refractive, um, targeted refractive outcomes. This is the way it's going throughout the world, and this is where it's going to continue to go. We have a myriad of lens types, and we're going to have to become accustomed with them all, each one of them offering different um, benefits at this point in time. The verdicts the verdict is still out on which would be the better ones. We still have a lot of ongoing work and lots of different um, mathematical techniques have been going into and optic techniques have been going to choose the different lens styles. There's no, the last word has certainly not been written on this. We have a variation of lenses. We have things like multifocal lenses, defective lenses that will give you near and far vision and intermediate vision with of different qualities. We have our toric lenses which are fairly standard, but the the level of the premium level of the toric lenses are imp improving dramatically. We have our standard lenses with our now our waveform generated analysis for the surfaces that will give us a lot clearer. And uh, as Dr. Sean um, Sian was telling us about some of the fairly expensive ones that will give us a lot better outcome. So we are at the stage where we can offer a lot, but we still don't have for the premium lenses, that assurance that we have for standard lenses. So our fallback would always be standard lenses and the best possible lenses that we can have. And then from that, we work forward and tailor make our care for each particular patient. But the, mo the overriding factor is we've got to make the understanding has to be there. And the patients we engage in, re in a refractive discussion have to be able to understand, trust you, ask the appropriate questions, and then we have to be frank with them. If we find that the patient is a fantastic candidate, but unable to understand or unable to be flexible with the discussion, it might pose a problem for us. And in such a situation, we might, might re want to rethink what we can offer these patients. So overall, a fantastic area, an important area, we depend on our colleagues, the optometrists, to help us tremendously on this because they are the ones to sensitize the patients that things can, we have technologies that exist that could take us, make us glasses free or make dec decrease the dependence on glasses. Mm -hmm. We depend on them throughout the, stage, the stages of this, both for referring in and for following up the patients after. So we need to, across the board, be aware of our, what services we have to offer and the products and the technologies, and then use that to give the best possible outcome. 
our, the most important thing is it's all in flux. And the more we do, the greater our knowledge base, our skill level. And this is a necessary part of the process now. Increasing numbers, increasing skill levels, and then being able to offer what we have, what we can at a high level. So we just need to hold on there, folks, and use it as much as possible in a reasonable way. And then the product is going to come. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dorian. Thank you for a wonderful summarization of uh, Renel's talk. I'll bring in um, Ronnie, um, your comments before I close this evening's uh, meeting. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Vinit and Dorian. And thanks very much, Renel. A wonderful talk, wonderful discussion. You know, these cases really is, is, is interesting. These patients now come in and asking us, you know, I, I think this patient, uh, all these cases actually were, were, you know, somebody asked, what is the optometrist if they are the, the main ones here? And what we found in at TH is, and Renel will tell you, these patients came to her and they tell her, hey, I, I want to, to, to get some refractive surgery or I want to change. I don't want to be wearing these glasses here. And then Renel comes to me and say, you know, I think we should offer this patient. Uh, a multiple color of a lens, yeah. So they are the ones who drive in this whole thing. And that is the interesting thing. It, it's a joint um, uh, project that, that is taking form be, be, in, 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 that I'm seeing between the, uh, the team or within the team. And that's really nice to see. It's particularly with this case, which is of interest, this patient was actually emetropic before he was 40 years old. So what what an unlucky guy, you know. <laughs> he got to, he got to 41 or 42 and he became hypermetropic, you know, all of a sudden he needs glasses to see uh, and to drive, you know. And then he got to 47 and he became press myopic. So, he, you know, he got a double army and he was really upset because he, he's not a customer this way. And, you know, when we told him we, we, could, we, we could correct his uh, hypermetropia and he would not need glasses for doing a lot of his uh, usual activities. He was over the moon. Um, yes, there was the issue of the uh, whether or not we, we should uh, give him a multifocal or monofocal lens to kind of correct his pres his new presbyopic problem. Um, yes, he was financially uh, challenged, and that's why he hasn't had the other either. You know, I know Renel didn't want to say, but this is what happens in society. People have these issues too, and then we have to find a way to help these guys out. Now, if he did have uh, money, you know, he pull up in the Porsche, as, as uh, Dorian was saying, and, and then we can all say, hey, take a month, Google. The answer is no. I, I think because of, of his job, you know, when you look at, when I spoke to him, I realized that this guy would need good vision. Although he's saying he really so desperate to get out of his glasses, I know that he's a mechanic. He's a guy who would need to see something really, really fine. He doesn't want halos or anything, or any risk of that, although he's desperate. I cannot give this guy a multifocal. I already knew that. I was glad he didn't have the funding, if you know what I mean, because then I, I had two reasons now not to give him this multifocal lens. So I, I think you really have to, as Sion was saying, judge your patient. You know, Don't only listen to what they're telling you, but look at what their needs are and really talk to them and, and give them something, because what you give them is for lifetime. It's not just for what is going on in their lives presently and their challenges. So you have to weigh up all of that as the guy delivering the care. And thank you, thank you, Ronnie. Um, as you rightly said, um, and we've had some wonderful talks today and wonderful contributions by the panelists. But what we also have to bear in mind is the pandemic is taught as another thing, that the myopia explosion is happening. It's not waiting to happen anymore with a lot of students actually speaking, uh, I mean, studying indoors, a lot of people staying indoors and using the screens, just like what we are doing using the Zoom. A um, lot, the, the myopia problem is going to get worse. And once the myopia problem gets worse, not everybody likes glasses like us. Um, they want to be independent of glasses. So they asked me a first question, why are you wearing glasses if you're recommending me not to wear glasses? So I said, as Ronnie pointed out, it's a choice you make about whether you want to get rid of your glasses or if you want to get rid of 
um, why your glasses need not be there. So there's a lot of things that boils down to the patient. Once the patient has made a decision, once the doctor has also made a decision, what is important is to ensure that the process that we have, and we heard Cyan talk about the process. And um, what Renel pointed out in the first case is the process. And we were able to identify problems and we sorted that out. And uh, our patient with toric lens implant and clear lens extraction has again demonstrated to us that our original ambition of keeping them spectacle um, independent as much as possible has been successful because the process of measuring these patients and assessing these patients has been wonderful. Communication of them at all junctures has been excellent. Patient has had buy-in to the process. The whole team has had the buy-in to a process. And as Ronnie pointed out and Renel points out, it's 20 happy and it's not 2020. It's never about the vision. Refractive surgery is a slightly different dimension that we have to appreciate. So it's a journey for us at TH. We're learning as we are sharing our experiences with you. And we're hoping to bring our consultant colleagues who support us in this program and, um, and educate us while we share the information with you all. Um, so our optometrist, Renal and Ibrahim, have been phenomenal in the support of these kind of activities that we do. And the whole team, I would again repeat that this is impossible without our team. So thanks to the whole team and thanks to everyone staying overboard at least 25 minutes beyond our scheduled time and still um, listening into the discussion. Uh, we look forward to you sharing your questions, comments, and if there's anybody who wishes to ask anything, please feel free. And if there's nothing, I will close the um, evening. Uh, thank you, guys, and, and everybody have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. Good night, bye -bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Good night, Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night. You don't want to go.